Good morning. Um, we'll get the uh, presentation started in, a, in about a minute or so, just uh, letting more people to uh, sign in and uh, then we'll get, uh, we'll get started shortly. Thank you. Uh, on my computer, the time is now 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and uh, I think uh, we, I can still see people uh, joining in. Uh, as we know, as you know, the uh, this session is being recorded. So for those uh, who are uh, late arrivals or uh, uh, don't don't get a chance to join us today, uh, they'll be able to uh, access this uh, this uh, session uh, through the pre-recorded version. Um, good morning. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Uh, if you have any questions or uh, uh, the comments, uh, please use the chat or question and answer tab at the bottom of your screen, and I'll be more than happy to uh, address it and, and answer your questions uh, at the end of the uh, uh, presentation. So I'm going to share my screen, and uh, we'll get started. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Shervin uh, Rehani. I'm a civil engineering graduate from Conestoga College. Uh, I have uh, uh, I, gra I graduated in 1986, uh, kind of dating myself now, and uh, I've been working in the uh, wood truss uh, manufacturing as well as uh, building component design in cold form steel uh, for the past uh, 33 years. Uh, we've done, I've done all kinds of manufacturing, design, marketing, as well as um, set up new plans. So I have a fairly extensive knowledge of um, the, uh, that end of the industry. Uh, I've also worked in the uh, concrete and soil uh, testing field as well a little bit, as well as uh, structural steel and coal from steel, uh, coal from steel manufacturing and uh, building components. Today, uh, we'll be uh, talking about uh, mass timber uh, or engineered wood products uh, that are available today. And that's really been in the past, perhaps, what, 60 odd years. And that's been re really made a difference in the uh, construction industry. So today, as, as I mentioned, we're going to uh, explore some of these other opportunities uh, that's available out there. Uh, then we're going to identify the appropriate engineering wood products, uh, envir environmental impacts uh, through uh, life cycle analysis or assessment, um, social and economic benefits of uh, wood buildings, carbon emissions and uh, durability and the uh, safety of the uh, wood products. So why do we uh, should we why should we use wood and or engineered wood products? It's there because they are prefabricated. Uh, they can be robust, uh, fire resistant, economical, energy efficient, eco friendly, uh, less carbon footprint, and they are a time saving uh, component of any uh, building uh, building construction. So some of the uh, engineered wood products that have been around since the um, early to mid 60s are uh, your typical uh, roof trusses um, uh, over here that are manufactured in the shop within the 16th of an inch tolerances. Your floor trusses here as well. These are manufactured to specifications. The depths can vary uh, to whatever the design parameters calls for. The difference between these two is that this one the lumber is on the edge, this one is lumber flat. So you have the wider nailing surface and that's why mostly they use in the floor system. The eye joist, the wood eye joist system that uh, was uh, more or less started back in the, uh, uh, I would say roughly around early 70s uh, to mid 70s. And they started off with that uh, lumber, but then later on as technology went up, they used uh, laminated veneer lumber as uh, uh, flanges as well. And this web member had to used to be uh, uh, plywood, but nowadays they're using the OSP, which we'll get into that a little bit uh, later in the presentation. Uh, here we have uh, wall panel construction uh, manufacturing uh, or fabrication, uh, uh, and this is something that's becoming more and more uh, popular, especially with our Canadian winters, uh, where we can manufacture these components in the under controlled environments, and so, uh, so we're not hampered by the weather conditions and so on. And of course, the more recent, more advancement in the technology of modular homes that's becoming more and more popular now. It's been popular in the United States for quite some time now, but it's getting more and more popular here in Canada as well. 
So a little bit more detail of information on the wood eye joist. Uh, the flanges are either wood or structural composite lumber or that LDL we spoke of earlier. The webs are either plywood or OSP, the webs being this portion of the material and uh, gradually replacing lumber joists uh, in floor construction. Uh, the advantage of these products are that uh, they can come in different depths. Uh, they can be anywhere from nine and a half inch to uh, 24 inch depth. Uh, those are the more common uh, uh, depths that they will come in. Uh, now, anything deeper than that would have to be especially manufactured. And normally they don't get into anything heavy, uh, deeper than uh, 24 inches. And of course they can span up to 60 meters or about uh, 48 feet or so. So the difference between the two uh, components you can see here with the conventional lumber and uh, eye joists is that with the conventional lumber, you have that crown uh, natural uh, built into the lumber. Whereas with the eye joists, you don't have that issue. So you could pra practically put the joists upside down and it's still gonna perform the same as what uh, uh, it's supposed to. And of course, because an engineered wood product, it does span longer than your conventional lumber. And it can be used in the roof system application if you want nice cathedral ceilings um, that come into a point or you can use them in the floor system with these holes already punched out so you can run into your duct, electrical, plumbing, everything right through it. Now, the holes can be punched along the lengths uh, within a certain reason. And of course, uh, it's always good to follow the manufacturer's guidelines in terms of where and how far apart and uh, uh, what sizes uh, the, the holes can be punched into these systems. The uh, manufactured uh, components, meaning uh, these, the, the difference between uh, this particular eye joist and uh, these other products is that the, the eye joists are manufactured offsite in, in uh, factories and they're kind of like a, a conventional lumber, like a commodity right now, where the, then the, the, the distributors in the lumber yards, they buy them in, in truckload or carload uh, the quantities and the stock. Uh, these products you see here, these are manufactured as per order. Uh, these are uh, what we call um, uh, also known as a space joist or uh, ultra V uh, being the shape here. And this is a hybrid of wood and steel con uh, um, mechanically connected uh, uh, system that apply that gives a, a, again some more flexibility in construction and they can be and these can be used in the floor application or in the wall application for the uh, net zero uh, goals uh, that uh, we uh, are going towards these days uh, and uh, so uh, the passive house and etc or in the floor system as I said earlier. Um, now in the commercial sector this would be the one that's mostly commonly used. These are like tube shaped uh, metal webs that are bolted inside the LVL type uh, uh, materials here and top and bottom cord to give that additional strength. And you'll see these in, in a lot of uh, commercial applications, perhaps in uh, Chick -fil -Chick, uh, the uh, uh, you know, Burger Kings and, and uh, Montana's or those types of restaurants. Now, this is what we were talking about, the lumber on the flat. You see the, the wide nailing surface or, or the narrow, the lumber on the edge, the narrow narrow nailing surface. So these components, again, they can be used for roof and floor application as well. And as you can see, they lend themselves to uh, many different uh, usages and, and, and applications. It, again, if you're you know, in areas where you want to have a loft or cathedral ceilings and so on, parallel court systems that allow, allow you to achieve those, uh, goal, those goals. And of course, the most common one that uh, is used now is uh, the roof trusses. These are uh, uh, computer designed um, with uh, proprietary software uh, by different manufacturers uh, that uh, manufacture these metal connector plates. These metal connector plates are pressed in, as you saw earlier in the uh, slide in this shop here. Uh, the, over here, the, this is how they uh, manufacture these components, and uh, they are they can go as long as 80, 90 feet even in terms of length. And nowadays, with even the advantage of the having these softwares available to us, we can create almost any shape, as you can see in one continuous piece. And of course, if you want an attic space, uh, it is, uh, you know, storage space, something that you don't want to waste in the in the um, in the space up above your ceiling lines. Uh, we can build these attic trusses that can be actually a room, a bonus room or storage room, playroom, whatever it may be. 
And again, another example of a flow truss uh, or roof. Uh, uh, well, we, we call these flow trusses because the lumber is on the flat. Um, and these, this is a commercial application uh, and it's being used as a roof system. So there's many different variations we can use. And we like to use these components because they are economical, to strength the engineering, they're versatile, we can come up with any shape and they're environmentally sound where we use these um, a very small dimensional lumber to achieve the, the, the spans that we are, uh, uh, we, we, we look for. And of course, the results are, these are the types of buildings you see them in, all the uh, eye joists and the floor trusses and the uh, uh, ultra V or spacious material material can be the floor systems and then obviously at the roof level it can either be the eye joist or floor trusses or it can be trusses or any other kind of a component uh, that uh, would be uh, you know uh, would lend itself to the um, to the application and uh, these uh, materials can be used in all kinds of residential and commercial applications all the way up to uh, institutional the only area i haven't really seen this stuff work is uh, or used in the uh, or in the penitentiaries or uh, detention centers where the code doesn't allow any combustible materials so now um, and then an example of the uh, uh, commercial application is the, uh, the, uh, the Grand Georgian village at the Blue Mountain. Some of you may have already been there. This is a commercial application of the uh, components. So it's not uh, basically, we're not using them just on typical, you know, two story, three story houses or condo town, townhouse projects. They can be used in commercial applications as, in the, as, as is the case in this case at the Blue Mountain village. Um, uh, again, commercial units at the main level and condos on the upper, upper levels as well. The uh, another area, the Starbucks in North Bay, this is just an example. There's many of, of these uh, uh, options there uh, and examples are there and this is just one of those. Um, uh, A&W restaurants, uh, they all use, uh, uh, most of them use wood construction, Tim Hortons as well, stores and what have you. Now these walls can be tall, what we call tall walls because you're, they're longer than your standard eight, nine, 10 foot wall system. They could be either conventional lumber or they could be uh, another mass lumber or structural composite lumber called LSL, uh, laminated strand lumber, which we'll get into in, in a little bit. And of course, uh, the modular type of buildings we talked about is uh, in the factories, they, they look like this, they, they use units are all that through the manifest designed in a, some uh, CAD or BIM type of a software and then this will be the end results. Now this example is the uh, Trinity Western University in British Columbia. Uh, it's uh, manufactured by Metric Modular. This is a student residence uh, that uh, houses uh, the, uh, that actually includes 90 individual modules uh, for this project and this is a five-story building. 55,000 square feet uh, overall, um, the, um, the square footage. And uh, some of the reasons why they used the modular system in this particular project was the fact that it was minimal risk uh, with centralized labor, reducing the dependency on the uh, uh, unreliable or, un or unavailable trades and uh, ensure consistency throughout the whole project. The control timelines, uh, the process allows us, well, allows the manufacturers to and, and the developers to minimize uncertainties due to uh, built up uh, from a different uh, upfront, at the upfront uh, planning stages. And of course, a faster completion, uh, uh, the modules can go together. This whole entire project was about 50% faster than any other uh, type of a project that uh, would be comparable in terms of uh, construction time. And uh, nowadays, uh, these modular type buildings are being used in the educational sector, where uh, the uh, actually the government of Canada or Ontario, I should say, they've also actually uh, mandated the use of obviously modular type building. I shouldn't say mandated; they're recommending the use of. Uh, uh, modular type construction because of uh, school projects they always run into a short time frame so the, these types of projects they allow for uh, faster turnaround so uh, by September schools are ready and uh, uh, open for, for students to attend. So this is an example of uh, this, this particular building you can see it comes in two sections with a central beam in the center and beam in the floor. And of course, well, this is what we call the CLT, cross laminated timber, which we'll get into a little bit um, for the few, few more slides. And these are our mass timber construction types. 
and uh, this is the end result from the outside, uh, double wide in a sense, and with lots of windows to share, to bring in natural lighting. And of course, this is the, this will be the uh, uh, inside picture with a nice open space and uh, a lot of natural light and a very strong and durable building. And of course, all the ventilation system and electrical system, as you can see also um, connected here. So these are what we call this, um, the modern engineering wood or mass timber products. Uh, uh, this one in particular is uh, mass uh, cross laminated timber is uh, very similar to uh, uh, reinforced concrete where the members are in perpendicular to each other and they have a major axis. So the lengthwise is the major axis and then the, the narrow or, the, or the, the other direction is the minor axis. So in this particular example, this would be the major axis because we've got two layers of uh, going in this left and right direction and then one layer going from uh, in, this, in this direction. And so therefore this, uh, this system uh, can lend itself uh, in, like I said, in, uh, uh, for, for those designing in um, the diaphragm design, this can actually help in the diaphragm design, design as well. Uh, this, again, this is called this uh, cross laminated timber. Uh, another kind would be the uh, gulam, uh, which would be uh, as a bean. It could be here, and this was an example of this is uh, right here. These will be gulam beams, and then um, the um, so can be used as a beam, and they can go anywhere from two by four to two by twelve width, and they can be used in various uh, projects that, that we'll see later on as we. Uh, so go through more slides and or they built in panels and these panels again as you can see they stagger together they glued together and they would uh, they, they're only good in one direction which is in the direction of the length of the material as opposed to the, the, so they don't have two-way it's not a two-way system it's a one-way system as far as any diaphragm design design is concerned additional provisions have to be taken in order to achieve the the, the, the diaphragm design. For uh, an, an, another uh, very popular product is called uh, uh, Parallel PSL or Parallel Strand Lumber. This was a uh, product that came out, uh, came out in the, I would say in mid to late 80s, 80s uh, uh, out of uh, uh, British Columbia. Uh, Macmillan Bloodell was the company that actually came up with this and then later on was bought out by some other uh, uh, manufacturers and uh, so on. So these are basically uh, strands of lumber they're about three millimeter thick and 20 millimeter wide, and they come in long strands. And these strands are glued together to create this beam. As a, they can be used as a column, it can be used as a beam. And you will see an example of this uh, where this is used. So for taller buildings where we need additional strength in terms of compressive strength, this is what is used. And then the glue lamp uh, beam that we saw before, uh, these ones here will be used for projects that don't require as much um, strength in terms of a compression as columns and so on. And this is a good example of uh, how we use, uh, utilize every piece of material. So there's hardly any waste when it comes into harvesting and, and using uh, the trees, uh, the precious trees that we have out of, uh, in, in Canada here. Um, another product called uh, laminated strand lumber or oriented strand lumber that we, we spoke of uh, laminated strand lumber earlier that was used for walls and uh, they are the, the major difference between the oriented strand lumber and laminated strand lumber is the, the, the length to depth ratios so the, 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 the length to the, to the width sorry the ratios this is the only major difference these chips are uh, placed um, as kind of somewhat uh, uh, randomly and they, but these strands are, they just try to go um, basically trying to do them perpendicular to each other. So one layer will be in this direction and another layer will be in this direction. And that's where these get their strength from. The, um, again, another example of the oriented strand lumber and parallel strand lumber. So oriented strand lumber and, uh, and parallel strand lumber here.
Um, some of the older products that's been around for hundreds of years is called the nail laminated timber or NLT, which is really what you see here is pieces of two by four all the way up to two by 12, depending on the spans that they want to, they want to achieve. And these are nailed together. And you see this in a lot of the older commercial buildings like old Canadian tires, old manufacturing facilities. Uh, they have, uh, this is the type of the floor system that they use. This is all before the advent of the was the use of um, um, reinforced concrete or core slab in the commercial sector. And uh, this is an example of how these go together and with the use of uh, uh, beams here to support these laminated, uh, nail laminated timbers. For the, the minimum size for uh, roof is uh, two by three, for floor is two by four material. So again, depending on the span, it could be two by four, uh, two by four meaning three and a half inch this way and uh, two and an inch and a half this way, all the way up to two by 12. Another good example of the, the mass timber is a dowel laminated timber or DLT. The good thing, the nice thing about this, the difference, the major difference between this product and uh, NLT is that with the NLT, if you need to put any openings in the floor, you have to be careful about the nails and uh, take some additional precautions or uh, uh, measures in order to, because of the nails being cut. With this particular system, you don't have to worry about that. You can pretty much put a hole within reason within this engineering space anywhere and it will not affect the structural integrity. The material used uh, are again two by four all the way up to two by 12. And uh, you, they, they can be varied in size as well, depending on what the span, uh, span is really that it's been trying to achieve, whether it be on the floor or roof system. And uh, also they, it can be used for acoustical um, materials to go in between for to, you know, to absorb some of the sound transfer and so on. And or they can be used to run uh, con all kinds of electrical and plumbing and um, uh, and the mechanical systems in, inside the floor or inside the roof system, uh, ceiling system. So these, lum the lumber used here, these are all uh, softwood lumber and the dowels they use are hardwood lumber. As the softwood lumber shrinks in uh, in moisture and the dowel, uh, the, the dowels themselves, they increase, they absorb some of that moisture. It creates a friction bond that doesn't need any glue or any nails or anything like that. And this can be, it ends up being just as tight as any other uh, mechanical or glue connection as well. Um, some of the other new ones are, uh, the, a more recent one actually is the uh, plywood uh, uh, laminated uh, or mass plywood panel, which is basically as it says, plywood panels and on top of each other, and they can be as, as deep as almost uh, 16 inches in depth or 400 millimeters in depth, and they can be uh, either sistered up with conventional lumber, depending on the strength that's required in the, from the system. Um, and they can be uh, sand, they can sandwich two by material inside, or it can be just be complete plywood material itself. So these are all what we just witnessed here. These are all examples of mass timber. And these are the types of buildings where they, 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 are, they are used. This is an example of uh, glue lamp columns, glue lamp beams with a CLT, cross laminated uh, timber uh, panels on the top and bottom here. And of course the openings to run any uh, mechanical systems and, uh, and, uh, and electrical and so on. Now, sometimes uh, the developers and builders, they like to leave the ceilings exposed so this stuff would go underneath the floor. So the, uh, the, 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 these panels will be uh, uh, sitting on, on a pedestal or, 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 dud or some sort of a raised uh, panel. And then of course the uh, CLT or NLT or DLT panels go on top for the floor. So, so with these products, uh, heights are no longer an issue. Uh, they once were and uh, timber buildings over 80 meters are already completed or been or are, are actually under construction in Europe and North, North America and Australia. Um, uh, though um, this uh, still do dwarfs uh, some of the biggest steel and concrete uh, skyscrapers, skyscrapers uh, growing expertise in improved R&D um, uh, as pressure to build sustainably and the ease of high restriction is quickly changing all of this. So this is an example of the uh, University of British Columbia student, another student residence. And we had, this was an 18 story building 
that uh, houses um, uh, students uh, 54 meters in height 18 stories the first floor is a uh, uh, concrete podium and then this, the rest of the 17 stories is all wood and there's all these columns and, and panels uh, use the, the, the glue lamp columns and the, the first first few levels they use that parallel uh, or PSL uh, columns, and then the upper floors. I think it was about fourth, fourth or fifth floor upwards. They use the glue lamp columns. So in this project, there was roughly about um, 1,298 columns, and, and it took about five to ten minutes per column, depending on the complexity and location. And there were 464 CLT panels uh, to uh, to install. So after the every every third floor, they enclose the exterior so that there is no uh, effect from the elements, uh, and, and such as rain or, or heavy uh, you know moisture coming inside to get the materials wet or uh, have any that could perhaps uh, potential damage to uh, more so called discoloration than anything. And this, as you can see, this is a, a, a plate and post construction. There is no beams. In between, so and because the grid uh, grid pattern is uh, small enough, this system was uh, actually was very helpful uh, uh, and uh, it worked very well. As you can see in this picture here, there's no beam drop beams or anything to affect the uh, the you know the, the, the sun light light coming in or uh, any 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 obstructions of uh, of any kind. So this project, 18 stories, it took nine weeks to build uh, with a crew of nine. And as I said, it took about five to 10 minutes per column and six to 12 minutes uh, for each, uh, each one of these um, CLT panels. And they did about uh, two floors per week. So two floors meaning floor and columns as, as they went along. So then this is a, a breakdown on the uh, materials used. Uh, so there was three kinds. One was the CLT panels, which was these ones here the glue lamp beam uh, columns, and of course the parallel strand lumber. So the first um, floor here, for the first, what is that, one, two, three, for the first fifth floor, uh, it was uh, parallel lamp, and then the rest were all uh, uh, glue lamp timber. So every project that we do, when it comes this, this, this uh, with the mass timber project, we always do a, uh, a carbon check or a we create a report card. So this particular building, 18 stories tall, um, well, 17 stories of uh, wood products, uh, had amount, this amount of about 2,233 cubic meters of uh, um, uh, wood materials, uh, known as obviously CLT and glue them. And all of that material can grow in US, between US and Canada, uh, that all that material goes in within six minutes. So that means there's abundance of material available for our consumption here. Uh, the amount of uh, carbon dioxide stored in wood, 1,753 metric tons. So this is a material that otherwise would have been um, released to the atmosphere either through uh, burning the wood or uh, using fossil fuels of any kind. So that material was actually stored in the, in, in the, in the wood, let alone uh, capturing everything else that came along with it. And the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that was avoided is about 679 tons of CO2 was, uh, that kind of emission was avoided. So some of the other potentials uh, benefits obviously is the carbon sequester. So when you add these two up together, you get, so th this is the amount 2,432 metric tons of carbon dioxide benefits uh, of uh, using wood materials. Now, these two figures here, the number of cars and the energy, this is somewhat subjective. It depends on the type of the car and the size of the house and the type of heat they use. But this is on an average, you average car, uh, and this is an average home of maybe perhaps around 12, 1400 square feet. And so this, these numbers could be plus or minus, but it just gives, it, this is just to give you an idea that potential savings in greenhouse gas emissions of, uh, for using wood. So the British Columbia um, housing um, project, this was the tallest building up until 2018, 2017, I believe. And then after that, this project in Norway became the tallest, uh, which, was, which is actually the third tallest building in the whole country of Norway. And this is again, all wood building from uh, ground up, uh, the, other, than, other than the foundation, obviously. Uh, it was completed in 2019. 
And uh, this was inspired by the Paris Agreement uh, to reduce the CO2 emissions. Uh, 85.4 meters, 18 stories tall. And it's about, this building is located about 100 kilometers north of uh, Oslo. Now, all the material is, uh, the exterior is all wood as well, but they're all fire retardant lumber in case of uh, fire, obviously. So, so the safety of the wood is taken into account as well. Uh, there are many other projects on paper and being thought of as we speak. This one is a 14 story, 80 meter tall uh, wood building. This uh, University of Toronto uh, is set to uh, build a 14 story building. This, this is a 14 story building. It's the academic tower, um, it's all made of wood or you know, timber uh, and it's on the, at the downtown campus. Um, at the time of announcement, it was expected to be the tallest mass timber and concrete hybrid building in North America. Uh, now planning and approvals are being um, in the, are in the process as we speak right now. And uh, the George Brown College uh, that's uh, expanding the waterfront campus to School of Technology and the Tallwood uh, Research Institute, the uh, the Arbor House, this is the Arbor House, uh, uh, the college's uh, School of Technology and Tall Building Research is located on George Brown College's uh, expanding waterfront campus. It's a 12 story low carbon building in, and is the first of its kind in Ontario featuring ecological innovation across its uh, entire life cycle and acting as a model for smart, sustainable uh, green building innovation throughout Canada. Uh, the construction is, uh, was scheduled to start uh, in, in, uh, sometime in 2021, and uh, there, there had been some delays, obviously, due to COVID and other issues, but uh, it's still uh, ongoing, and uh, uh, keep an eye on it. It will be up, uh, they will start construction very soon, if they, if they haven't yet. Um, so mass timber is also making headway in our school system. Uh, this is a uh, Toronto Montessori school. Um, the architect was uh, Ty Farrow, Farrow Partnership, and uh, the supplier is uh, a local uh, Toronto, the, the manufacturer, fabricator, and engineering firm, uh, 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 Timber Systems. Uh, you can see the arches, these are all glue lamb arches and glue lamb beams here, and then the NLT uh, roof panels here. And it's just amazing the, the type of structure and all of these elements, they're not for sure. Each one of these elements, they do actually provide structural integrity to the whole building. And these are all CNC controlled machines, machined materials, uh, all computer designed and uh, driven. And uh, uh, these uh, connections, everything goes into a BIM system and uh, it's all manufactured on site as well. Sorry, at, at a factory as well and delivered on site. Uh, another example of um, Montessori School uh, in um, Elgin Mills. This is uh, sorry, Elgin Mills campus. Again, you can see the same same architect. You can see the tall uh, glue lamp beams and of course columns and beams and uh, the there's NLT uh, roof panels. Again, creating these arches and bringing basically nature back into the classroom where, where, the, where the, our children and our, uh, you know, our students are uh, learning um, and uh, trying to live and, and learn f by and close to nature as, as much as possible. Now, this is a dining hall, which also you, you guess used for other activities as well. Example of uh, T3 Bayside is a uh, Heinz uh, company out of United States. Uh, they have started construction on a 10 story building. This is a 13 acre site on 261 Queens Key in Toronto and it's part of the waterfront project. It's about 2000 acres uh, revitalization plan. Uh, this is a, a, and some of you may know um, uh, Michael Green. Uh, his vision was uh, timber transit and transportation. His idea was that you know, the, the communities should include uh, everything that you need uh, within a close proximity. Uh, so for example, you have your shops and businesses in the main first, second, maybe third floors, your residences above, and uh, your, so your transportation will be either bicycle or walking distance to work and entertainment and so on. Uh, again, to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels as well as uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. 
and of course uh, the first commercial NLT nail laminated timber building to reach the uh, uh, heights in Toronto in Canada as well. Uh, it's the 77 Wade Avenue, uh, eight story building, 14,000 square meters, and it's about 78% exposed wood. Uh, again, the, the panels are NLT and the columns are uh, glue lamp beams. Now, there are some uh, steel and uh, concrete uh, uh, panels as well in there, just as a, as a hybrid system. Now, this, is, uh, this project is also scheduled to be completed by 2022. And of course, as, as I mentioned, the strength and the capability of mass timber, it, it's just uh, tremendous. Uh, this is an example of a... Um, soccer stadium it uses uh, 13 uh, uh, 13 archers and uh, it's just a massive structure there's no way any steel and concrete could compete in terms of cost capability of this uh, particular structure the olympic um, 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 oval uh, these uh, beams are 100 meters long and uh, again with beams going uh, glue lamp beams going in the other direction as purlins and of course with the roof finishes so these are some of the massive buildings or uh, structures that uh, can, wood timber and you know engineered wood products can provide for us so the days are gone to say that you know only steel and concrete can achieve such goals and of course, in Europe, they're, they're going even further by uh, using wood in parking structures as well. So obviously the floor panels and uh, topped with uh, some sort of uh, asphalt or concrete uh, topping for uh, more durability and uh, lateral stability. And of course, columns and beams all made out of wood. So shops on the main floor and the parking structure on top all made out of wood. Uh, this one is uh, a project in... Uh, uh, where was it? I believe it was in uh, Sweden. And of course, bridges. Um, uh, these bridges, the good thing about the, the building wood out of uh, uh, bridges out of wood is once your deck is up, you can actually drive on it. It's not like uh, concrete that you have to wait till it cures and you know go through the whole motions. But this one, as soon as the material is in place, in dry run and there's no curing time required so the strength is there and you can see the the usage of the good the, the bridge this is a 30 meter long bridge and uh, 34 meters overall actually it's 30 meters from here to here and an extra two meters per side to, to the ends here And of course, uh, this one is uh, another example of uh, the mass timber construction. Uh, now, the whole, basically what we're saying is that all districts are being, are appearing in all, all several cities. Uh, we can achieve the spans needed to build airports, train stations, and bridges additionally. Uh, and uh, to the, the proven well-being benefits of wood are making a difference in all, in all, all other projects like schools and hospitals and so on. So how does wood help us uh, in uh, as far as our so social benefits of it? Uh, the, the wood industry is supposed to the um, uh, direct job creation in, in Ontario of over 155,000 people in, employed in this field. And that's just a number that keeps going on and on and on. Uh, areas rich in forests can, uh, that can supply wood for mass timber and other building products uh, could see an economic benefit in advancing uh, mass timber construction. Uh, using wood from Ontario will create jobs and economic opportunities in northern and indigenous communities. Instead of being in metropolitan areas, plants and factories situated such that uh, land and uh, building costs will not affect the viability of manufacturers while uh, extending job opportunities and other technologies to the, to the distant communities to reduce our dependence on the metropolitan areas. The biophilic benefits uh, also will have a huge impact. There's a lot of studies being done by different organizations uh, and the effects of the uh, uh, wood environment. Uh, as an example, the hours of sickness is reduced. Uh, the competitive advantage is increased by 40%. Hospi people in staying in hospitals, eight and a half percent shorter in staying in hospitals. And children in, in the wood environment learn 20 to 26% faster. And uh, 
there are some uh, studies that show that the heart rate actually reduces by 6% in a wood environment uh, as opposed to uh, in your the typical uh, concrete block building. So if, imagine you walking through the forest, you're very relaxed, very in, in with the nature as opposed to walking downtown Toronto. Now this is the type of the feelings that you know, uh, the, the wood construction can bring for you. In, in, in your environment. So if on the outside, you cannot have that, at least on the inside of the building with exposed wood materials, it can help in all of these areas of um, biophilic uh, tendencies of wood. FP Innovations, they've done a, a recent study uh, of a British Columbia, um, which was uh, between wood and human health. Uh, I, I strongly suggest go to their website, FP Innovations. You'll find a uh, uh, wealth of information on this. Uh, they do have a publication that I would suggest strongly for you to read. Uh, the, um, they talk about the um, sympathetic nervous system activation and they this is responsible for physiological stress responses to to humans this results open the door, this result opens the door to a, a varied way to a lot of different ways of looking at stress related health benefits that the presence of wood may afford in the built environment the application of wood to promote health indoors is a new tool for practitioners of evidence-based design. And you're gonna see a lot of architects uh, and designers uh, uh, leaning that way as well. And a lot of this is done you know, in, in schools uh, that we see a lot of this happening as well. The current study shows that the classrooms designed with biophilic elements improve test results, uh, test scores, uh, uh, support health and increase learning rates as we showed earlier as well as uh, the visual connection to nature provides a positive impact on cognitive, psychological, and physiological responses. It influences an individual's mental health, performance, and well-being. There are many other uh, ways of achieving this biophilia now. Uh, since we you know, destroy the land or, or uh, excavate and whatever to build buildings, why not add some uh, natural elements to it, either roof gardens or gardens per floor and, and, and the, uh, what do you call on the balconies or even on the exterior face. All of this helps with absorbing that carbon dioxide as that carbon has been uh, uh, exposed to the, to the atmosphere, as well as give that sense of the one being with nature. This is the Amazon or uh, the, the uh, sphere. Um, and, and this one, they've as I said that they've had 10% less employee absenteeism. And this is all nature-based uh, ovals that they have. They have three of these little pods all on the same site and they're all designed in this fashion here. And of course, uh, the Bosco vertical in Milan, Italy it was inaugurated in 2014. Uh, two towers uh, instantly became a valuable landmark of the city of Milan and its uh, most forward thinking mentality. Um, the architect's firm uh, behind the uh, uh, Bosco Vertical was inspired by the novel, The, the Baron in the Trees, uh, in which the, uh, the protagonist uh, uh, decides to leave the ground and uh, live on the trees. So Centennial College in Toronto, the 14-story, uh, 80-meter tall uh, St. George campus of uh, uh, University of Toronto and uh, the George Brown College all have the same thing in common. They're all built with only renewable construction uh, material, which is timber. And they've taken sustainability uh, and they're taken from sustainably managed forests. The components of these buildings are engineered and assembled in factories like this. And uh, factories like this, uh, wood is the only material that has been consistently used to build with for thousands of years, but often some major fires and then the advent of the steel and concrete, the industrial revolution, and the birth of the skyscrapers, it fell from favor and was rarely seen outside the house building. But that's changing. The old problems of strength and fire, the, 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 and then fire and the deforestation are all being answered and the old excuses for not using wood have fallen apart. And as our planet stands on the edge of a climate catastrophe, partly brought out by the, our reliance on unsustainable construction material is starting to change this.
So today, building components can be made quickly in almost any size or shape and uh, for, for, for any project as we saw earlier. Uh, elements like walls, floors, and even whole building sections uh, can be made in factories, factory controlled in, uh, conditions and environment um, before being transported to sites. Once, uh, uh, once, they're, once there, they are assembled on concrete foundations. It's easier, faster, and safer than other building uh, techniques. Um, we're not using timber planks, uh, which are coming from the, from the forest. Mass timber engineered wood products in, are generally great innovations that we have seen over the last few years. Few years, we're talking about last 50, 15 to 20 years. It allows us to build higher, bigger, and in better quality than ever before. So it's time to build everything with wood and timber. So you're probably freaking out by about uh, freaking out about uh, now. We've just said that uh, you know every building should be timber and advocate chopping down trees to make uh, uh, buildings that are flammable, right? Well, no. Uh, really, to understand this uh, material and why it's exactly. And what we need right now, you need to understand how it's made and used. So, where does the tree, uh, to the material comes from? We have your natural grown, growing forest and uh, naturally growing forest here. And the, the, as, they, as the trees grow, they capture the carbon dioxide and they uh, continue to help us in our uh, goals of uh, clean air. Now, Anywhere from 80 to 120 years, trees normally fall down because of age and they don't grow as much anymore, especially the uh, softwood lumber. Now, this softwood lumber, if you let it fall to the ground and decay, that CO2 gets released back into the atmosphere. But if we sustainably and, uh, and uh, professionally uh, f forest uh, this, uh, uh, sorry, uh, harvest this material and put it in buildings and furniture and, and toys and et cetera, the, all the carbon that would have been exposed or gone back into the atmosphere, first of all, is stored. Secondly, it's all gonna be inside our buildings. So what would that mean is we will have this, once we go through this motion here, we will have all this carbon captured and stored becomes basically a carbon bank. That carbon stays in our building until the end of use. At the end of life cycle of this building, many things can happen to the lumber. It could be recycled, it could be reused, or it could be burned or as fuel, or it could be buried into the ground. If it's buried into the ground, that release of the CO2 is going to be a lot slower. If it's burned, then it's no different than any other fossil fuel that's going to burn and release uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So if we can find other uses to, to um, use that lumber, it's, it's better for our environment. So what that means is approximately one cubic meter of concrete, if you replace that with one cubic meter of wood materials, we save one ton of carbon dioxide. Now, all of this carbon talk here is, is great and fantastic, but what we need to do is have a systematic approach towards our embodied carbon at the end of the, the life cycle. Now the life cycle used to be, you know, we look at, okay, well, from now until the building's built, but well, that's changing now. The ap approach is changing to go look at like 50, 70, 80 years time because most buildings, especially on the commercial side, they have a design a lifespan of 50 years. Now, that doesn't mean that they're gonna you know, collapse after 50 years. They last for longer than that, of course, but due to economic and social um, changes, those building usages may, may end. So therefore, the building has to be either re, re, um, uh, resurfaced or re, refurbished or torn down and a new building come up because of the local needs and then the community needs or the, and the, or the commercial needs. So therefore, and what we need to look at is the, what we call the life cycle. So right now, and the building codes have done a great job in um, uh, helping us understand the, uh, uh, the release of uh, carbon dioxide gases through our energy usage. So the energy uses as the building continues to grow, as the building gets older and older. So energy efficiency has become a major issue. As, well, as, as opposed to the actual materials. The materials, as you can see, the, the, the energy used for them at the beginning is fairly high, but then it stays that way. It doesn't go any further. So it takes roughly about 10 to 15 years for the, uh, the uh, operational energy 
uh, to reach the uh, actual um, embodied energy of the carbon. And then from here onwards, the more we save on the or uh, improvements we make on the operational energy, the better we are in uh, 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 achieving our goals of 2050. And as well as the same thing goes with the, with the materials. The less uh, carbon extensive uh, materials we use, the better we are. So this range could even go further could take longer for the uh, the energy or embodied the, the uh, operational energy to reach the uh, level of our uh, uh, what do you call the construction or embodied the carbon of the product so why do we care about all of this as we build more efficient buildings uh, the proportional impact of the environment uh, due to materials increase relative to the uh, operational energy of what we said earlier. And this came from a Net Zero Home Leadership Summit. And it's time to consider the impact of materials used. We do not want to choose a solution with high negative impact on the environment just to reduce operation, uh, operational energy. Some of the other systems that has benefits of wood is obviously the uh, Wi-Fi signal. This is just a recent study that came out that wood has the least amount of resistance in the transfer of uh, data through the, uh, through the walls as compared to steel and concrete. Um, coming up to 10 to, uh, 10 to 11, so I've got a few more slides, not too many, and then we'll open up the uh, floor for questions and answers. So the prospect of every building, uh, uh, to build every building with wood or timber can instinctively raise concern, especially when it comes to fire. Now all buildings burn uh, and they carry the, that risk. Uh, timber buildings can be made to burn in a much more predictive, predictable way than those uh, built with steel and concrete and can be designed to be even safer. What we mean by that is, in an example here, you see buildings have already burned, so, so any any, any building, regardless of concrete, steel, or wood, is going to burn. And the, the, the effects are, can be different. Now, in terms of wood, it chars and then it falls eventually under extensive heat. Steel can lose its uh, uh, tensile strength or under extensive heat and uh, start collapsing. And of course, concrete will fall. And once it falls, the compressive, compressive strength is gone. Now that the steel, the reinforcing bars are exposed to the heat. So therefore, that can collapse as well. But when it comes to wood, wood has a, what we call a char, char layer. This char layer is actually an insulator. As long as this is in, intact, it reduces the amount of uh, heat here. So then therefore, by the time it reaches the core area, it's going to take a long time. Now, what we do is in designing these materials is this would be our typical size. And this is our design size. So for example, if we want to achieve a, a two hour rating, we know the predictable rate of charring or burning is 0.65 millimeters per minute. So if you want a two hour rating for, for the fire, we want to make sure that this is about three inches from there to here, from there to all, basically all the exposed faces of the lumber. So when we design our wood members to be this wide, three inch wider all the way around. So after two hours of fire, the fire can just about to, just about to reach the actual design strength of the lumber. So to give you an idea, this is an example. This is what the design strength was, and this is what it was actually built, manufactured. So that by the time, you know, even after two hours of fire burning with the under extensive heat, you still have that predictable and strength of the building is still intact. So the beginner guaranteed building is not going to fall down. This is how we can make you know, wood buildings or timber buildings better and stronger than steel and concrete. And of course, in terms of durability, we got this pagoda in, in Japan built in 1607 and reconstructed in 680. And this building, five stories tall, all are built out of wood, no mechanical connection, all uh, uh, joints uh, are uh, mortises and, and, um, and uh, joints uh, to, to get joined together with no nails. And of course, uh, this other one in China, uh, built in 1056, and again, still standing, all wood construction. And uh, this chapel, this is some of the examples uh, that I, I could find for you. There's many other examples. This bridge is in Switzerland as well, built in 1365 and still standing. It was damaged in, uh, due to some fire, but then it has been restored since. 
And of course, the uh, moisture and threat of mold is another issue. Um, uh, although water can be entirely removed from CLT, uh, in, uh, the, the, the CLT material, these are kiln dried uh, and they are usually around 12% moisture content. And uh, most of our engineered wood products are anywhere from 8 to 12%, even if they are exposed to some elements that could reach up to 14%, uh, which is almost uh, not uh, negligible. And by the time the building is completed, the uh, moisture content can come easily down to uh, 10 to 12 percent, which is the, the tolerable levels. Um, I won't go through this uh, exercise. It's just very quickly to show you the, uh, the, 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 the effect of moisture into uh, compared to what actually is. So at 55 percent relative humidity the, uh, and at 26 degrees Celsius, you're looking at about 9.9% uh, moisture content in the material. So and we said roughly around 8 to 12% moisture content is uh, acceptable. Now, for lumber to get, uh, you know, to, for mold to grow, we need, the, uh, we need to be within this range here, 99% relative humidity and moisture content of 23 to 30%. So give you an example, most recently, like even with today's uh, temperature of 32 degrees, 31 degrees, and the humid, depending on the humidity, it has to be 95% humidity before the lumber can actually reach that 24, exposed lumber reach that 24% um, um, moisture content. That would obviously uh, promote the growth of mold. So this here proves that in terms of mold and mildew and what have you, it's still a good viable solution. Finally, um, who we are, we are Canadian Wood Council. Uh, we support these, all these types of construction, our mission to expand the market access and increase demand for Canadian wood products and uh, do it through excellence in codes, uh, standards and regulations. Uh, we are a, we represent the Canadian wood industry through a federation of a national federation of associations. And of course, uh, in here in Ontario, Myself and uh, my partner, uh, Timothy Bueller, we uh, are the technical managers and our director, executive director is Marion Brubay. And if you have any questions, we are uh, your contact points. And of course, these uh, presentations wouldn't be possible without our uh, thank you to our uh, sponsors and supporters of the industry. And uh, some of the services we provide are, uh, we do one-on-one -on -one technical inquiries, uh, we have a help desk and we do project meetings and presentations. Um, we also uh, come up, we have produced publications, design manuals, uh, span tables for building officials, case studies in case somebody is interested. Most of these are available on our website. Some majority of them are free with the exception of these two publications. And of course we have software for design, uh, connections, Shibble Sizer and or as a suite, all, all three together. And these are subscription based. And of course, we have some free software to calculate your R value, your beam calculators, uh, your uh, carbon calculator, and so on. And of course, uh, at the end of the day, of course, you know, buildings with timber can't eradicate the use of other materials. Uh, we still need concrete foundations, and some buildings are often hybrids of steel and concrete. But we need to uh, keep in mind this wood first uh, attitude. And uh, that brings me that back. To, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope uh, I was able to uh, inspire you and uh, provide you with some insight as to what we do at Canadian Wood Council and what products can do for you. So uh, for now, I will open the floor for any questions uh, that you may have, and uh, we'll go from there. I don't see my chat box here, and I'm sure there's probably something in there. Okay. No. Any questions? Well, you have my uh, contact information on the screen here. If I, I do apologize, like I said, I don't see the chat uh, box for some reason. And uh, let me, if I was to stop my sharing my screen, maybe that helps. Oh, here we go. Here's a chat. Here we go. 
uh, chat is disabled uh, yeah unfortunately but anyway so we have the questions and answers if you have if uh, if I, if you have any questions please reach out to uh, tca office or uh, my myself even uh, we are uh, i'll bring back my uh, uh, my uh, screen here to give you the opportunity to take down my information. Uh, so yeah, uh, by all means, uh, get in touch with me and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. And uh, or we also provide our uh, for free project assistance. So if you come across any projects that could perhaps need some assistance with on site or uh, in, in, in your design office, we'd be more than happy to help out. Um, well, uh, good question, uh, Natasha here uh, for one-to-one -one project support. Uh, what can we uh, expect to achieve with this? Now, it all depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for uh, uh, the manufacturers, the uh, uh, where they are, how to uh, how to approach them, or how to uh, uh, contact them, or uh, just an introduction or we can even help you with your design. As you're doing your design, we can help with, uh, uh, with a grid pattern, identify the most appropriate uh, spans for the, for the different materials you wanna use uh, or the goals you wanna achieve. If you wanna find out what your, uh, these are just some examples that, are, again, that comes to mind. If you wanna know the carbon impact of the materials you're choosing, uh, we can help you with that and uh, to ways to reduce those carbon impacts and so on. Uh, when it comes to the matter of cost of the project, we can again look at the design, keeping the architectural and uh, uh, structural integrity together and coming up with different materials that would help in reducing the cost or uh, making it more appropriate for the design. So, so those are the types of projects we do, um, assistance we can provide. Um, we have issues with the building officials, uh, interpretation of codes, we can help out with that. Uh, we're very active with the building code as well. So if there's something that uh, needs to be brought up with the national or the Ontario local provincial, or in this case, Ontario building code, we will take that on for, uh, for the industry as a whole, if it's, uh, if it's gonna benefit the use of materials. Um, as it is just a bunch of things that comes comes to mind that I can that we can uh, we can provide you and uh, if there's anything specific again uh, contact us uh, if we need to put you in contact with the consult with the uh, consultants we can do that as well. Okay. So I hope that answered your question and um, I don't see any other, oh, here comes another question. Uh, oh, Ali, you're more than welcome, my pleasure. Um, on that note, uh, I think it's, uh, it, is, it is after 11 o'clock now. Uh, welcome, Natasha, as well. And um, again, um, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to help out. And uh, I will fix this uh, date here as well. Uh, I don't know what happened with the nine here. <laughs> so anyways, um, have a wonderful day, rest of your day. And uh, hope to see you or uh, meet with you at some point. And uh, stay safe. Bye for now.